This conference yeah. will now be recorded. We're going to begin with a couple of prayers and let us pray. A prayer for our world. God of love and hope, you made the world and care for all creation, but the world feels strange right now. The news is full of stories about coronavirus. Some people are worried that they might get ill. Others are anxious for their family and friends. Be with them and help them to find peace. We pray for the doctors and nurses and all who are working to help those in need and discover the right medicines. Thank you that even in these anxious times you are with us. Help us to put our trust in you and keep us safe. Amen. Almighty and merciful God, you are the only source of health and healing. You alone can bring calmness and peace. Grant to us, your children, a consciousness of your presence and a strong confidence in your love. In our pain, our weariness and our anxiety, surround us with your care. Protect us by your loving might and permit us once more to enjoy health and strength and peace. And this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, we've been having quite a missional conversation, I, th I guess, in all our churches of late. And our own diocese has been doing some uh, pretty focused work over the last couple of years. And uh, that work continues. We find during this unusual time that we've had to reinvent everything, including our understanding of mission and how that mission is carried out. So I think this is a very timely conversation that we're having today, and it may not be a one-off, there may be others to follow on. So I'm, I'm grateful that we could gather uh, in this way. Um, bishops have a, a, a unique perspective on the church, and we, we maintain an awful lot of different kinds of relationships with a lot of different people. It is quite obvious to me right now that uh, a fatigue is setting in. A lot of us have grown uh, fatigued over the last six weeks or so with the enforced type of isolation we're dealing with. Uh, some of us are getting fatigued with this type of communication, frankly, and I, I chatted with a, a group of bishops this morning and it, it seems to be a common thing right now. So it, it's helpful for us to acknowledge what we're all feeling and also to reflect on what that means for mission right now because the mission of God continues in the world and that mission is playing itself out in, in incredibly uh, fresh ways right now. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm, I'm looking forward to the contributions of everybody. And uh, I'm going to be doing a, a fair bit of listening, but once in a while I, I might comment as, as necessary. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Bishop Jeff. We're going to now move into the section of uh, dwelling in the word. I've uh, asked uh, Bishop uh, John Oregon to read the passage, the passage that uh, Alan suggested that we use for today, one we're familiar with in the Easter season, Road to Emmaus. I'll ask you, uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop John, if you'd uh, turn on uh, your camera and your uh, microphone. And what we'll do, folks, just to kind of prepare you for it, Bishop John will read the passage, and then we'll ask you to take moments to, uh, to reflect uh, on it, and then he will reread it. And then I'll ask you to share thoughts, insights, comments that you'd like to share uh, by entering them on chat, and I will share them uh, with the group. Chat is the button on your GoToMeeting uh, dashboard. Uh, others, uh, other than Bishop John, can turn off their microphones uh, to uh, make sure we, we can hear without interruptions. Bishop John. Thank you, Dr. Rick. Uh, um, Dr. Rick had asked me to say a few words about this reading in terms of its location, uh, having lived in Jerusalem, as you know. Uh, it's about, uh, first of all, let me say there are three or four competing places, sites for uh, to be the original Emmaus, and uh, that dates back quite a ways. Uh, but it's, it's basically uh, where the pilgrimages go. It's about uh, seven kilometers or so uh, or seven miles or so uh, northwest of Jerusalem. 
and it's a very interesting place. It's a, a place of rolling hills. It's in the Judean hills. It's kind of like Cornerbrook here, uh, not not like Rockies, but like you know, uh, rolling hills, and uh, steep in places and high in places and uh, deep valleys. And uh, and and what's really interesting about it is that it's the it's the main roadway, even today, uh, when you. Coming up from the airport down near Tel Aviv, up into Jerusalem, you got to drive through this area, through the Emmaus area. And when Pontius Pilate, for example, who, who resided mostly over in Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast, would come up to Jerusalem, he would cross, a, you know, come straight across uh, from the west to the east and go right through Emmaus area. And, um, and today, when you drive through there, uh, from the 67 war between Jordan and and, and some of the Arab countries and Israel, uh, that was a major, major place of warfare. And uh, today, a number of Israeli tanks, they've been painted up and cleaned up, but they're on the side of the road in that area. Uh, we did a pilgrimage there once, and as we were walking through the, the valley in, in this area of Emmaus, uh, reflecting on this reading that we're having today, uh, there was gunshot heard, but it's from a, it was from a firing range. Being a military person, it, it wasn't scary to me, but for some of the folks, uh, it was, was alarming. But it, it kind of uh, uh, sensitized us and, and made us uh, ex uh, experientially aware of threats, you know what I mean? And especially the conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. But the, 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 what's really important for these two disciples from Emmaus is that they were probably very familiar with Roman occupation, with Romans constantly coming through their community, going up to Jerusalem, back and forth. And uh, they were probably very much expectant and hopeful for a Messiah that would take care of that very real problem. So just to have that in mind as we read the, uh, the reading. The Lord be with you. And also with the you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Clopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, 
But they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them who said, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, we'll just give you a few moments of silence to ponder the word, and then Bishop John will read it again. And, and when he reads it again, I'll ask you to listen to the reading with your minds and hearts open to what the Spirit is addressing for today. And whatever that is in your mind and your life and your community. Okay, Bishop John, when you're ready, and thank you for the good background and description of the context. Thank you. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. When their eyes were kept, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but them, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He appeared to be going further, but they constrained him, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. 
So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished out of their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them, who said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Thank you, Bishop John. So we'll invite now when you're ready for people to share a reflection or a thought or an insight when you're listening to the word. Send it to me by chat and I will read them as they arrive. We'll do that. We probably won't read all the comments because there will likely be more than, uh, than needed, but we'll, uh, or more than we have time for, but please uh, share a thought or an insight. One is that it's interesting that they asked Jesus if he was the only one who didn't know what was happening, whereas he was probably the only one who really did know what was happening. Blindness to the obvious. reading is lengthy but i am made aware again of the fourfold action of the eucharist jesus took blessed broke and gave that's from terry Keynes. thanks terry Another well, comment is on the place of family. Maybe the two disciples were a husband and wife, maybe Clovis and Mrs. Clovis. She was at the foot of the cross. In this time of social isolation, it's a new time and age for many couples and the opportunity for intimacy with Jesus. Bill Strong says the passage highlights Eucharist, and today we discover new ways of celebrating the breaking of the bread. Fred Marshall says, their hope was not lost, even though they thought it had. Deborah Penton says, when we are journeying through difficult and sad journeys, <clears throat> like now, we never know who will join us on the journey. The stranger we offer hospitality to may turn out to be Jesus himself, or certainly to be offering hospitality to Jesus when we extend it to the stranger. Bishop Jeff says, godly play talks about knowing Jesus in a new way at Emmaus. Sue Squire says, being unfamiliar with the Bible as I am, what is the significance of Jesus disappearing only after in caps, they recognized him at the Eucharist. Bill Haynes says, 
makes me think about how many times Jesus may be walking with me through others and I do not see him as clearly. Jonathan Rowe says, it's not enough just to encounter Jesus on the road. We also have to discern his presence and recognize him. Frony Squibb says, how often we encounter the Christ in others and often do not recognize him. Robin Trevers says, the imagery of the breaking of the bread, so beautiful. Janice Rowe says, I find myself taking a deeper value in what happens around the table. In recognizing Jesus at the table, we see Jesus in each other. Linda Budden says, from despair to joy, emotional swing. Bill Strong says, the passage reminds me of the Rolling Stones song, you can't always get what you want. Canute Francis says, the hope that is waiting to birth new life and possibilities in our affairs. Paulette Bogdan says, it is interesting the two realized after the fact their hearts were burning when Jesus was talking to them. A reminder for us all to pay attention and keep the ear of our hearts open to Jesus speaking. Robin Toll says, when we only focus upon our own sense of loss, we begin to lose sight of what Jesus calls us to do, to be and lose sight of Jesus' presence. I guess it's to not lose sight of Jesus' presence. A moment to see if others have a comment. Nora Shearer says, we are finding new ways of sharing the gospel, knowing that Jesus is on the journey with us all. Owen Howell says, the part where Jesus seems to go further. Sorry, I said that before I finished. Mm -hmm. no uh, what I wanted to say there was that, you know, Jesus... Uh, Seem to be going further, but they invited them in. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alan. And the, the part that I liked about that is like, you know, we have to do the same thing. We have to invite Jesus into our life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for those insights and sharings. We'll have opportunity later to have um, have some discussion and sharing. And I know that uh, Alan is gonna help us kind of reflect deeper on that passage and bring it into context. But for now, we will have two vignettes. I've asked uh, two people to share not everything that has been going on with them in this time, but at least a bit of it, insights about their role, their life, their ministry, and what they have discerned and, and are continuing to discern. Uh, I've asked uh, Reverend Amanda Taylor uh, and uh, Reverend uh, Robin Toll. Uh, so uh, I'll ask you, uh, Robin, first, if you turn on your camera, turn on your microphone and uh, share your vignette with us, your incidents, we might say. Good day, everyone. Uh, excuse my bald head, but uh... It's more comfortable when I leave things off of it. So uh, my apologies for that. Um, but this is a part of the, the journey. Uh, thank you, Rick, for um, inviting me to do this. Uh, before the pandemic began, of course, uh, I started the challenge of um, dealing with cancer and treatment and, and my own um, journey of how I was going to minister to others. Uh, being new in ministry, you know, you're always trying to be open to listening and seeing what the people are saying. Um, I know since I've been here in Hermitage, we've spent, I've tried to spend some time, uh, you know, reiterating about missional work. Um, we've talked about so much of just surviving um, the financial end of, of, of ministry. Um, so, uh, I felt that the seeds were being planted uh, for this time. So Rick had asked if 
we would just speak about a couple of things. So um, I, I wrote down several um, that uh, we identify, but um, my uh, one thing that I'm looking at now is the social aspect. And I know you say, well, social aspect in ministry, but you have to know your people and you have to identify with what, what connects them. I know at Queen's College was very important that we gather together as a community. Uh, we would laugh and, and get to know one another. And in the social aspect of, of that, that's what we've been doing. And I find by, you know, in, in speaking with people that they're missing that um, portion. Um, they seem to be getting lots of, uh, you know, um, uh, services online and things like that, but we seem to be missing that aspect of that social gathering, that coming together, um, talking, you know, it's okay, yes, they say we can pick up the phone and talk to somebody, but it's not the same as looking at them eye to eye. So I find that that's one of the challenges here uh, in them connecting that way. And also I find the challenge of teaching. Um, I had just begun a confirmation classes um, and we only entered into maybe one or two classes. And, and then now it's, um, and, and of course we all know that most of the children that come for confirmation now are not children that are very active in the community, but we have families that come and, um, and speak um, you know, that they want their children to be confirmed because they were baptized. So we speak into that um, with them. So the challenge that I had now is trying to connect with them um, in this way, in the teaching aspect, our Bible studies, uh, which is very important here. So those are the two things that I've identified at the moment um, that I'm, I'm trying to address uh, here in the parish of Hermitage and, and in the ministry of, um, you know, the church being closed during this pandemic. So, so that was, uh, those were the two things that I was uh, addressing today. Thank you, Robin, and thanks for sharing your thoughts and, and a little bit of your history of the illness. We wish you well. One person sent Thank a you. note for pass along the word to you that uh, all is beautiful. Some of the rest of us can <laughs> say. Indeed, uh, indeed. On that too. But anyway, blessings on you. Thank you, thank you. Amanda, we'll ask you to do the same. Turn on your camera and your, your mic. Hi, everybody, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, Rick, thank you for the opportunity to uh, engage in this way. It's greatly appreciated. And um, certainly, as all of us have come to know over these past few weeks, to say that the past number of weeks has uh, been a significant learning curve would, would be an understatement. And in a very short time, we have been thrown into a brand new way of being, not just as the church, but certainly as the entire world. And while we are seven weeks in, as we all know, this is quite a fluid situation and it's ever changing. So we always need to be adaptable and flexible in, in how we're learning how to live with this. But for me personally, um, I have adapted to the situation in this new way of being right now. And uh, I guess I'm still very much unpacking though, the things that are happening and the messages that are being proclaimed to us as a church in the midst of this time. So with that in mind, there are just a couple of things that uh, I'd like to reflect on and share with you. And uh, certainly like Robin, I too, as a people person, am missing gathering and being with my parish family, also very much uh, missing the sacraments and the ability to uh, to come to the table with the people of God. So it's a, it's a very new and different time for sure. But um, over this past little while, as I've had time to reflect and uh, more time to read and things, there's a quote from Brian McLaren that's really resonating with me. 
And Brian McLaren, as many of you would know, is um, is a pastor, and he's also an author that has uh, authored uh, many books, among which have been um, A Generous Orthodoxy and uh, The Great Spiritual Migration. So I just want to share with you a quote that uh, I've been reflecting on. And he says, it's not about the church meeting your needs. It's about joining the mission of God's people to meet the world's needs. So if we take that down to its most basic level, he's actually saying like, uh, you know, it's not about you, get over yourself, move out of your comfort zone and get on with the work that God is already doing in the world around you. So um, we have quite literally been forced out of our comfort zones, forced out of our buildings and thrust into this whole new, for some of us, virtual world. We've gone from speaking to a congregation, in my context here in Portugal Cove St. Phillips, anywhere from 70 to 100, 120 people on a given average week, where I can interact with them. I can gauge their body language, their level of interest, at least what they show me non-verbally, and adjust my actions accordingly. And now we've gone to speaking into a computer screen where a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity of reaching over 1,500 people. And there were over 900 views. Now, we all know what that means. But still, there was an engagement with this large number of people. And during the live stream, there were at any given time, 75 or more computers connected with me. And that's just computers, not the people who were actually worshiping with me. So the reach has been incredible. Um, you know, it's certainly much, much larger than we uh, than the people we would reach on our average Sunday. And while there is whom I would call our core group of people from our parish that tune in weekly, most of the names and the comments that we're receiving are from people who never attend our liturgies or people who have never connected with us in any way before. And while we have been experiencing, while we have been experiencing social isolation and physical distancing for seven weeks and learning the, uh, the impacts of that in so many different ways, there are many people in our communities, namely the sick and the shut-in, who have been experiencing this social isolation for many months, and in some cases, even years. And now, because we have been forced to engage more in this virtual world, they too feel that they can be a part of what we do as a church. And to hear how thankful they are and how appreciative they are has been um, a true blessing, for sure. So we've gone from a few people attending our liturgy at a time and a place that is predetermined by us, so it's on our terms, to people being able to worship and pray in their PJs, with their families, with their morning coffees, in the comfort of their own homes. And uh, the church is reaching more people because of this. So there's a message here. I'm not sure what all the implications of that message are, but I will continue to certainly reflect on that and unpack it. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing, just quickly, for us here in uh, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, a big blessing during this time of pandemic has been our newly formed pop-up pantry. And uh, for a number of years now, our parish has been involved in a Christmas hamper project where, you know, a couple of months before Christmas, the parishioners collect money and we provide um, we provide food and other incidental items to people in need at Christmas. So during the Christmas season, we, you know, fill 20 to 25 hampers. And since my time being here, we sort of reflected on that. And we said, you know, if this need is here at Christmas, it doesn't suddenly just go away for the rest of the year. So there is a need in our community that we identified. And we said, how can we reach that? So we decided to start the pop-up pantry here in the community and we brought in uh, community leaders and you know people who have vested interest in, in our community and we started this pantry so portugal Cove st phillips is a community with approximately 7300 people and there was no no food bank and um it's a very affluent 
community here. And of course, as we all know, where there's affluence, there is also poverty and uh, it's often quite hidden. So um, since starting this food bank, we have helped uh, countless people. And since this pandemic, it has been mind blowing to see how the community has come together. Our telephones are constantly ringing with people who want to financially support the food bank. Um, and not only that, with people who, who want to, on a go forward basis, um, come and volunteer with the pop-up pantry and help us to deliver these hampers. So these are people that have no affiliation with us, no connection with any church, and uh, they see this ministry happening and the way it's meeting a need in a community, and they want to be a part of it and they want to help. So it's truly been overwhelming. Um, we've had the town come on board and other community organizations that have not only given us um, monetary donations, but they have also used the money to purchase food from our local convenience stores here during this tough economic time. So it's it's been helping our it's been helping some of the most vulnerable in our community and it's been helping a local business. So it's just truly been a blessing to see how uh, this is a ministry that yes, it is housed in the church and the church very much uh, runs it, the church being the people of course, but um, the benefits of this, uh, you know, we don't get any financial benefits. We don't get any increased attendance because of this food bank and nor was it ever intended to do that. But uh, it's just been helping people and bringing people on board with a ministry uh, that is needed here. So uh, those are the two things that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you very much, Amanda. Great. Thank you for the good work you're doing. I'm going to pass it to Alan now to share his thoughts and insights and all that he brings to the session today. Uh, many of us know Alan, but uh, in the meantime, I want to do a short introduction. Uh, Alan is a, a clergy of the Anglican Church of Canada, is in Vancouver, and is uh, has published a great deal and participated in numerous uh, workshops and teaching <coughs> sessions, a great resource across North America and around the world in the uh, missional initiatives and really efforts at renewal uh, towards building the kingdom of God in more missional ways than uh, uh, than uh, some have been, we might say, embedded in. So, Al, I'm going to pass it to you and uh, delighted to have you join us today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rick. And thanks, everybody, for uh, being on this event and particularly I want to thank Amanda and Robin for sharing their stories, which are of both the um, the disorientation that all of this is creating, as well as the creativity and the energy that you both communicated. So thank you very much. And um, I, I want to share a little bit uh, on what I am observing um, over these last numbers of weeks, uh, months now, um, that's happening to people and to leaders on the ground. Uh, in the midst of, in the short term, this pandemic, and would invite you to, uh, where there are questions and comments uh, that that spring to your mind, to to write them down, and Rick will be monitoring those and prodding me in the midst of it. So I want to share for a little while, and then we can do some uh, Q and A. And I'd like to begin very briefly, sort of with a broad lens. Um, and to locate this pandemic uh, in something else. Um, because in many ways, while the pandemic is itself a crisis that has to be addressed, it, 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 it needs to be set into a larger process that's been going on in European Western societies for the last several decades. Uh, we have to understand that we are in something which in one sense manifested itself in the 2008 economic meltdown and all of the disruptiveness that that brought about to the what seemed to be solidity of western cultures and societies and economics and then coming out of that there was a whole period of further disruption in what perhaps is best seen as uh, the brexit debates in europe and the the emergence of what one would call Trumpism, 
uh, and new kind of nationalisms and xenophobias, a whole sense of political disruption around institutions and organizations that we've taken for granted. Uh, and then on top of that comes this pandemic. My point is that we really need to place the pandemic in the midst of these overarching disruptions, that there's an unraveling going on that's hitting our own sense of ourselves in the society and the institutions and organizations. And it's like the pandemic is sort of a final blow that's come to us, and that's what's creating so much of the disorientation and is challenging our normal responses to manage what goes on. So that's big background. The second point I want to make is what's happening on the ground to us, both as clergy and probably most, most of us on this meeting today are clergy, but also people who are non-clergy, uh, ordinary regular people. What's happening on the ground? And um, just, to, just to make a note that uh, probably like you, uh, I live uh, three doors down from the hospice, uh, our, our, our city hospice, and less than a block from the hospital, which has become a major center for the intake of people with, uh, with the virus. And so every night, probably like some of you, at seven o'clock, uh, our family comes out and other families come out and we bang pans and we're, we're we're part of that. So all of that is going on in the in the midst of it. But the at the same time, what I'm observing, and I have conversations with clergy all over North America and other countries pretty much every day. What I'm observing are several kinds of things that are going on. One, um, the kind of language that clergy across all kinds of denominations are using is a sense of disorientation, a sense of being overwhelmed, a sense of having very little bandwidth as clergy try really appropriately to engage with their own people and the people of the communities around them. How do they care for them? And, minister to them and be pastors with them and that's created lots of that anxiety and that sense of little bandwidth out of which to operate there's not much left at the end of the day these are some of the descriptors that are coming and alongside of that there's also it doesn't get talked about a lot but there's a real fear amongst clergy because in many, many ways, what this pandemic has meant is that with the closing of their buildings and their services and their meetings, there's not the same amount of revenue coming in. And this creates, as it would for all of us, this anxious sense of how do I put food on my table? So these are all of the feelings and experiences that are going on. Something else that's happening across the board with clergy particularly in their disorientation, is how do we practice that for which we've been trained? Uh, one of you mentioned missing the Eucharist, this capacity to gather our people to, to sacralize the gathering around the table in the Eucharist and to be those who administer that. It seems as if what this pandemic has done is in some ways take away the very habits and practices, the very identity and roles for which we were trained and for which we were present. And that's part of the disorientation. So we have that going on. And at the same time, we have something else going on. And these are in, in, in many ways paradoxes. So as in a sense, the sacred and the liturgical has been taken away from us at the very same time in the midst of that what i'm observing and it's not just me i hear many others saying this we're observing the resacralization of the ordinary and the everyday we're observing the renaming of the sacred and of liturgies of the everyday 
amongst our people. And, and that's a strange paradox. It's almost like a shifting of the location of the sacramentalization of life into the neighborhood and the everyday. The rediscovery of the rituals of walking to or driving to the supermarket or each night going out at seven o'clock to bang our sounds or the re-recognizing of people who we've taken for granted. Uh, the, the people behind the tills in the supermarkets who have just been there in our conveniences, we're now seeing as almost like local heroes who are serving us in fresh ways, where the working class, those people who can't afford to stay home, but who must go out and work, somehow now are being seen as critical people, as, as people who are blessing us. So you've got this strange paradoxical shift going on in the midst of this, this whole disorientation of our roles as clergy, this resacralizing of the everyday in some amazing ways. The second paradox that's going on is that to the extent that we have been put into isolation, and a number of you, uh, Robin and um, Amanda described this, to the extent that we have been prevented from being with, the paradoxical thing is that the ways in which people are discovering being with one another are going up. But where they're going up is now very, very interesting. They're no longer going up in the places where we drive to be with other people. They're, they're going up, the connections are going up on the street in the park as we walk and so uh, just down the street from where i live is a large park uh, it's about half a kilometer long and it's it's amazing to notice what's taking place we're very different than before this uh, this virus people are gathering in clusters now they are keeping six foot apart, but every day around certain times, they're gathering and they're talking to each other. And in some parks, people are coming out and playing the instruments. Others are buying coffee one at a time and sitting. The connecting is going on in amazing ways. But this connecting has its own particular distinctiveness about it. It is the connecting in place and in the local. It is the removing of cars and vehicles and the rediscovery of the rituals of the ordinary and the everyday in place. And that's a whole new thing. Now, what's going on is that we are discovering, and it's not just us, that across the street, our neighbors we've hardly talked to before. They come out at seven o'clock to bang their, their, their drums and that, and we're waving and we're talking. And we are discovering that in the house across the street, just around the corner, hidden away, that we've never seen before, are, is a First Nations single mom with her young daughter who come out to bang their ceremonial drum. All this connecting is actually going on. And all of that comes together in a very different resacralizing of the ordinary and the everyday. So this tension is going on. There's clearly a sense of loss and anxiety and disorientation, and it's real and it cannot be played down. And yet at the same time, there's all this other energy and life and hope happening and percolating on the street and in the neighborhood. I would say I've spent several years working with congregations and helping them to understand how to be with people in the neighborhood. People in congregations have been with people way more in the last six weeks than ever before. It's pretty amazing. So these are two major pieces that are happening. What I want to do is go on and say a few other things uh, because people keep saying to us several questions 
what do we do in the midst of this? And that what do we do is about us as leaders and church folk. And secondly, what's coming next? And I want to briefly respond to those two things, and then we can stop and do uh, questions and, and responses. But in terms of what do we do, there's a number of things I think that are really, really, really critical. The first, particularly those of us who are clergy, is that we need to be able to be the pastors and caring people of God for which we were trained. That is critically, critically important. Uh, my observation is that people need that more than ever. The rituals of, the cl of clergy presence and pastoral care are very important. Keep doing that. At the same time, I would say, in terms of what do we do, step back from being overwhelmed or putting all one's time into trying to find other ways of planning worship services or running meetings or that sort of thing. We need to do that, but we need to carve out other time. And the other time that we need to carve out is less about what we do and what we give and how we can be of help. And it's much more about how we can join with and listen and receive from. And what I mean, and happy to talk about this a whole lot more, is that um, <clears throat> what's, what's happening now in our neighborhoods and communities and amongst the people of our parishes is that our people are engaged in discovering all kinds of stories about what's happening in the neighborhood, about connecting with people. And these connections and happenings are happening in ways that are quite different than normal times. These conversations with others. A friend of mine uh, told a story of what happened to him last week where he, on his street, he sort of posted a note on everybody's door saying, hey, uh, if people need shopping done or you're, sh or you're shut in and need something, blah, blah, let us know. And lots of people responded, but the most poignant moment was when a single man in his 50s who lived down the street sent my friend a message and said, would you go for a walk with me? And that's what my friend is doing now. In other words, our, our neighborhoods and our people are filled with these stories of what's going on. and. They may be confused about what's going on, but like Jesus joining with those two disciples on the Emmaus Road, we need to join with our people and listen to the stories they are wanting to tell us about what they're discovering, what they're discerning, and what they're engaging. And the reason for that is because it's in these stories of our people that the Spirit of God is gestating a different future and a different future for the church. You will have read, as I've read, lots of people saying, we're not going to go back to normal. This is going to change so much for the church. Well, maybe. I'm a bit skeptical about that. My feeling is that the, once these quarantines are lifted, a lot's going to go back to normal. Capitalism is going to come at us like never before to make sure that the curve of getting everything back on the stock exchange and all is going to go on madly. And unless we, particularly as clergy, are attentive to what's going on now on the ground, what's happening these days in the local is going to be lost in the mad rush back to normal and the security of our roles. And so now I would say, in terms of what to do, enter in, be with, attend to, and listen to the stories of our people, of your people, because in them are the clues to what God is doing. And I really don't want to hear people say, but I can't be with my people, because it, it's actually not true. We can go for walks. We can keep six foot. 
I do something regularly every couple of days. I have what's called six foot coffee. And I invite people on the street over and we sit on our deck six foot apart and have coffee and talk. There's all kinds of ways around this because that's what people are discovering. So we need to care for people, but we also need to attend and discern what's happening. Where is God in all these discoveries that are going on? And then let me quickly finish this question of what's next. Here's what I would say very briefly. You don't need to listen to gurus telling you here's what's going to happen next because they don't know. But here's what I'm convinced of. Is God's spirit amongst our people in the local neighborhood and communities is already fermenting and gestating all the clues to what this can look like. And our role as leaders is not primarily to ask what's next but to dive in and be with and listen and to attend to these stories. Finally, and I hesitate to say this a great deal, we have been in a crisis and there's going to be more crises coming. It was Winston Churchill that said during the war, never waste a crisis. And the thing about a crisis isn't that it comes out of nowhere. A crisis always has antecedents. It always comes out of stuff that we have been pushing away and choosing not to address. And for us, particularly as church leaders and clergy, this crisis can be, maybe not at this moment, but soon, it can be a gift when we stop and look at what we've kicked down the road, looked at the issues that we've put aside and not wanted to address and begin to face them. Now, I've written about this in a blog. I don't want to get into it too much right now, but this crisis isn't just about a virus. It's not just about economies. It is about our whole way of being church. It's about the kind of role and identity we've developed as clergy. It simply cannot carry us into the new places where we're finding ourselves and the unraveling of Western societies. This is a moment to stop and take a hard look and address those. So these are my observations. Uh, Rick, let me stop and let's do some conversation and Q&A. Thanks, Alan. Wonderful insights. Thank you very much. What I'll uh, invite now is for people to respond with their insights or comments, questions uh, in a couple of ways, either open mic. And if you're going to do that, please just uh, turn on your mic and, and have your comment. Uh, and uh, Or the other thing you can do is you can send uh, your note uh, to me as you did with the previous ones. And I will, uh, I will, uh, uh, read them out. And so I uh, have a couple uh, comments already, one from Terry Keynes. Uh, he says, uh, I have learned that it is possible to find and create a sense of community no matter where you are, but there is no doubt that it's more natural and easy to do in a small town. People just tend to care more about each other and want to feel connected and help each other out. Uh, Another comment there from Jonathan Rowe, he says, what support do we most need from leadership in the institutional church to help keep us from falling back into the old ways of doing things that were of the original unraveling, or that were part of the original unraveling? And uh, one here from uh, Nora Shears who says, very profound. Is God calling us out of our comfort zones to meet his people outside of the institutional and out amongst the people? The reading today was very fitting. That we walked amongst the ordinary and have not recognized Jesus in the midst. So those are a few comments that came in on the chat line. Send more if you have them. But if you want to uh, uh, open mic and speak to, uh, speak to Alan and to all of us, do that as well. 
I think uh, just, just a, a couple of comments, uh, Rick. Um, the person who said this, is, I think, is Terry, is probably correct that in, in small towns, there, there, there tends to be more opportunity to connect. At the same time, I live in a city. Uh, um, I, I can tell you stories over the last couple of days where, and this is the new thing that's going on, uh, just down the street, um, in um, maybe 100 yards away, I walk by, and there's a guy outside pruning his uh, plants. And 40 minutes later, we finish talking. Um, that hasn't happened before. Mm. Though th th there's a connection that's going on. Uh, same thing, uh, just in another direction, uh, there's a guy out uh, fixing his fence. Uh, we stop, but we talk. That readiness to talk is so present right now that we can engage in all that. So thanks for that comment. Uh, the other piece, uh, Jonathan's piece about what support, um, I, I, since I'm, I think the kind of support in this unraveling is, is really how small numbers of clergy can come together to develop some actions and practices in conversation with the bishops and others that begin to press into some different roles in their context. My experience is, and I said this when I was there with you in September, the kind of shifts that are needed we can't do by ourselves. And, and one of the most defeating things um, is when clergy hear what I'm saying and they go back and they're on their own. Uh, they, they might be energized by the kind of things I'm saying, but when they get back and they're immersed in the demands of the everyday, it's very difficult to imagine how do you practice new roles. So I think that just the capacity to gather and begin to shape some simple practices is one of the critical steps to take. But that, that's a much bigger conversation. Thanks, Alan. I see uh, Barbara Boone has uh, her mic on. Barbara, do you have a comment? Barbara? OK. Just want to mention also, folks, that if uh, you have questions, comments, observations to share with the group, you can enter them as text on the chat, and I'll read them. Or uh, you can uh, just open your mic. Rick, may I say a couple of words, John? Oregon. Yes, please, Bishop John. Yes, you can turn Thank on you. your camera if you'd like. Oh uh, no, that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Alan, thank you so much. I appreciated uh, your comments and insights. Uh, very encouraging. I, I just want to say from the perspective of a bishop uh, here in the Diocese of Western Newfoundland that um, it's been extraordinary actually the, the kind of uh, capacity of the clergy to remain connected to the their people in the parishes uh, to use, uh, you know, social media, to engage with people, uh, perhaps to connect with people who've not been connected with in quite a while. But there's been a, a, an energy and a, and a uh, something quite uh, out of the ordinary about it for me. Uh, just just listening to the clergy every week, which is also new. Uh, we spend two hours together uh, using this means to talk every week, and uh, there's a there's a you know a feedback time where every every all of the clergy each of the clergy speak about their what's happening with them, and and it's brought us closer. It's given us a deeper sense of each other's ministries and what's happening in the parish and so on and and in the diocese. Um, it's it's been for me a real sign of the church's strength and of our people's commitment to the church um, and of new people reaching out to the church. It's been a, an amazing journey that way. And uh, it, it just encourages and uplifts the, a sense of spirit about it all, that we are together, we're in it together. 
We're in it with our communities, with our, with our uh, you know, uh, provincial government, with our federal government. Uh, it shows the strength of the country in so many ways. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's an encouraging time and it reveals something of our strength that I think for a long time, uh, especially within the church, we didn't realize was there. And we've discovered it is there. And we've discovered, I think, as well, that it's in our country. So I've been really encouraged by it all, to be honest. Thanks, Bishop John. I want to read a, a note from Bill Haynes, kind of related to that. He says, this is an exceptional opportunity to be present with others in our faith communities. And I agree we need to be able to listen and help others try to make sense out of this COVID-19 uh, COVID, uh, trauma and to locate our Christian faith within it. What comes to my mind is the, the pastoral challenge of helping people find meaning in this time when, you know, Earl Goldman says a, a trauma in a person's life is an event that shatters the things you take for granted. And I suspect if any of us were to sit with a scribbler in front of us and a pencil today and list all of the things that have been shattered in our own lives, families, communities, province, nation, and world, we would run out of paper. So many of the things that we take for granted are gone. But in some ways, it brings us to a deeper level of the things that we kind of take for granted in the sense of, you know, just assuming it would always be stable and there. Uh, and it brings us and, and probably others to the more substantial and, and, and values-based and faith-based uh, components. And uh, I think in some ways, maybe that's where we are today, literally in this moment and in, in this time, is peeling back obstructions to what really matters and perhaps things that we've yes taken for granted in in a good sense and in the the darker sense of taking for granted one of the pieces um that i i would want to uh, lift up <clears throat> is that this moment of crisis is unusual and in the midst of the unusual people are behaving in, 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 in wonderful ways that we're noting and describing. But the, uh, the tendency will be when everybody gets a sense that this crisis has passed, is that there will be a deep exhaling of air and a very quick return to what people think is normal as quickly as possible. And that one of the critical things for us as leaders and clergy is to ask the question now, what's going on here? And I tried to describe some of that. And to Jonathan's question about support in shifting, what, are, what do we need to be doing now to be lifting up what's going on and inviting practices that can sustain it when this is over? Because, just to use an example, um, the, the, this return to the local and a resacralizing of the everyday is because we are in quarantine. But the moment it's over and all of the globalizing tendencies of our economies kick in, that resacralizing will very quickly disappear. Now, that's just one example of what would it look like for some of you as clergy to come together and say, what might we start to be doing now to help some of our people reflect on what's going on and ask what might be some practices we can continue to develop as we move past this crisis? Um, hi. Okay, thank you, Alan. So? Yeah. Um, I'm finding this conversation extremely exciting um, because, as some of you know and some of you don't, I mean, I've been away from the church for about 35 years. Um, but now I'm actually excited to be a part of this community because it's changing so drastically and so quickly. 
that I think this particular pandemic is actually an opportunity to change um, some of the thoughts and, and ways that we've, that the church has been doing. Uh, I find it really interesting how, you know, for the last few years or well, much longer, I'm sure that all kinds of religious communities have been worried about their attendance, worried about their churches falling, you know, into smaller and smaller places. Um, but I think now is probably a good time to save our communities because it feels like to me, this could, could potentially, and, you know, wishful thinking and all, but it could potentially be um, an evolution of community mission that it, everybody is interacting, um, like Dr. Roxburgh said, that, you know, in new and wonderful ways and much more frequently and often as, as much as we're isolated, it's, it's almost like all the biases and racial prejudice and, you know, race, religion, all that stuff doesn't really matter anymore because we're so desperate for personal connection that we'll talk to anybody now. <laughs> <laughs> so I think too, that because the churches have been reaching out in digital ways, and reaching so many more people than they would on a Sunday morning, that this is a good time to start perhaps putting in place some routines and some rhythms with these methods that people are comfortable with uh, and have been touching base more frequently with than they would with the physical building of the church. So maybe this is where we start creating new routines within the church. It's just my opinion and yeah, I know it's wishful thinking, but I really like this conversation. Yeah, well, thank you, Sue, and thanks for sharing your your own faith journey and and connection to church and community and, and Queens College. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I have a couple of comments here. I'll read one is uh, here as uh, Queens College Faculty of Theology, so it's probably uh, it's likely one of our faculty members. I'm not sure, probably Carmel or John. Um, but anyway, it says there will be some who are more ready to move ahead. Perhaps one of the things leaders can do is not tie them to those who are still fearful. One size cannot fit all. Leaders are being called to provide the space needed for the spirit to work in the local settings, which will differ from community to community. Another one there from uh, Rob. Rob Cook says, two things we need now more than ever. One, cooperation with others from other denominations to learn from and work alongside each other. And two, we need to empower and free lay people to do ministry and get beyond the clericalism that is holding us back. Help them see that the connections they might be making in community is church. And one from Bill Strong. Bill says, I suggest that people, I don't know, I don't know, sometimes when a new one pops in, it knocks out my screen. I suggest that people have found that we, the church, can be relevant during times of crisis. It seems that as we find more purpose and cooperation among our politicians, there seems to be a rediscovery of the importance of family and personal contact. And Robin Toll from Hermitage is saying, I thank you for your words of insight that challenges us as clergy to realize that we are thinking, that we are listening and doing all things, filling in the space to keep our churches open, keep people spiritually mature. But we are challenged now to learn from those we have been called to serve. It gives us a true model of what Jesus has been calling us to do. To me, Jesus taught but he listened more. Maybe that is what the road to Emmaus is saying. Jesus listened to the people and as clergy, we knew, need to do more of it. Thank you for opening my mind to this. And thank you, Robin, and thank you for sharing as well. And Cynthia, Cynthia says, I really like what the speaker said about new rituals. When we get back to worshiping together, most places won't live stream their worship. 
but they could offer some kind of online worship to reach those who found that a meaningful way of connecting. So those are some comments, uh, Alan or others. Bishop Jeff, I see your camera's on. You might uh, have comments uh, as well. Um, yeah, this has been really uh, riveting to listen to you, Alan. I really appreciate this. Um, my reading here is that things are not going to go back to normal as we understood them. I think there, there will be some um, resetting. And um, it's also very clear to me that we're all in different places. The writer Damien Barr said we're not all in the same boat. We're actually all in our own boats, but we are all in the same storm right now. And uh, it's clear that every single community is in a, in a different place. Some have been working very hard to transform themselves. Others are, um, I hesitate to use the word stuck, but, but they are. And this is, uh, is accelerating the, the need and the recognition for change. Uh, I think, at least in this diocese, there's going to be an immense uh, increase in the amount of live streaming and connecting uh, digitally. But I think some of the relationships formed. You talk about your neighborhood. I can talk about mine. I've been talking about uh, talking with uh, neighbor. I've, I've 25 years this month. I've lived in this house, 25 years. And uh, when we all moved here, the, the place to, to use a Newfoundland expression was maggoty with children. We were all young families with young kids, and all the kids have grown up now and moved on, and we're all middle aged now and and beyond. And I've spoken with neighbors in this neighborhood I have never spoken to before because of this. And I am, I am really hopeful because of all of the, uh, all that's happened that that's just going to continue. So I remain hopeful. Yeah, there's going to be some pressure to go back to the way it was, but there's also going to be a lot of pressure to, to move forward uh, creatively and uh, innovatively. So, but, but thank you for your words. Um, Let's do this again. Thank you, Bishop Jeff. Bishop John, uh, I saw you have your uh, mic on as well. Do you have a comment? Uh, well, I would certainly, you know, uh, affirm what Bishop Jeff has said. I, I, I think it's, uh, I think going forward, it will be different. We'll utilize a lot of the things that we've learned already in these past number of weeks. And even at the national church level, uh, there was a comment the other day when we met as the House of Bishops. That we've not that we not lose what we've gained. So I can see a lot of things continuing, uh, but certainly for me, I, I just I'm just more encouraged and discouraged. And um, I, you know, as uh, our friend was saying about not losing a good crisis, uh, quoting uh, Churchill. Uh, I, I think I think in many ways that's what's happening with us. We are learning as we're we're going through it. But also, I think we're being uh, taught resilience and uh, renewed hope, and uh, and that we can do this, and, and and our strength has come forward, and I'm very very thankful for that in that sense. I mean, obviously, it's a tragedy too, with huge losses uh, in so many ways, especially for those who've died. Uh, but uh, out out of this tragedy and and challenge for the whole world, I think can come a lot of good. Indeed, and thank you very much. Thanks for sharing that insight. Folks, what we're going to do now, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Greg, uh, Greg Mercer, to uh, bring us to a, a short theme on missional discernment, hearing from the church. Then we'll hand it back to Alan for any last minute comments that he might have. And then uh, uh, Greg will do a closing prayer for us. Uh, yeah, well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, like everyone else, for joining us today. Um, and um, and like uh, our bishops have been saying, very encouraged by what we're seeing. What we're seeing. Uh, I've been asked to do a little, a little reflection, uh, what we call a missional discernment, as a kind of a closure to today. So um, when I was thinking about this, there was a couple of passages actually that came to mind. Um, uh, two of them involves the Apostle Paul and. Two of the passages uh, um, all of you would be very familiar with. And the first is uh, from Acts 17, where Paul is before the Council of Areopagus in Athens, which is the cultural, cultural capital of the world. 
And as far as we know, Paul is all alone. He's, uh, he's very distressed according to scripture. And so he finds himself in a very different environment, uh, a new place surrounded by the biased Stoics and the unbiased Epicureans and, and a number of other people who believe all different kinds of things about different gods. So what was Paul's reaction? Paul is very clever. He, he is, in fact, an innovator. And the point of innovation is Paul's procedure. And for the first time, he deliberately takes up the position of philosopher. He does so not by condemning their religion or their gods, but rather recognizes it as a legitimate conversation partner in, in his approach to God. And so standing before the council, he is able to use the situation and reference an altar with an inscription to an unknown God, making the point that God, who is the one God, this unknown God, the one God, and also saying that it doesn't, this is the God does not live in temples. So here we have a wandering Jewish preacher who finds a way to mix and confront the cultural sages of Athens. How he used the situation is nothing short of amazing. And the second passage that, that kind of uh, kind of came to my mind was Paul's in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter nine. And again, Paul finds himself in a very strange place, not, not just geographically, but but nevertheless, a place that required him to kind of, quote, fit in uh, if he was to have any success in his overall mission, of course, which was to win as many people as possible for Christ. But Paul's approach is worth noting. Um, he steps out of his comfort zone in order to fit in with different people. Some people, some others may call that adaptation. He, he, in his words, he says, to the Jews, I became a Jew. To those outside the law, uh, I guess reference to Gentiles, he became as one outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. I have become all things to all people so that I might by any means save some. So fitting in without selling out is something that Paul was very good at, driven by his ambition to share the good news of Christ with others. And again, so again, Paul is quite clever. In order to connect with people, Paul must be with people in ways that God's blessings of salvation meets people where they are, in their context. Again, very, quite amazing. So, so we too find ourselves in a very different place, a whole new environment, far removed from the temple or the church building where we traditionally approach God. But this is not a time to be asking, I don't think it is anyhow, question time to be asking questions from the church context, you see, because this is a place of new social realities with their related challenges and opportunities. And of course, many churches have adapted to the COVID-19 reality, as we've heard from Robin and Amanda and so many other stories from Alan and so many more that we can repeat. But when we look at the example of Paul, we discover that adaptation is only the means for further creative and innovative missional thinking. How can we as church be the bearers of good news in a whole new community context? Churches that will thrive in this new reality, of course, will be those who find ways to fit in, to converse and partner with people where they are. You've heard, uh, you heard Alan, of course, talk about um, resacralization, and that's a new new term for me. It's, I've heard it several times in the last week, and um, it's an interesting word. And if I understand it correctly, it is simply about people rediscovering the sacredness of the local as in neighbor helping neighbor. The sacred, in other words, is no longer to preserve the clergy, if we ever if we ever thought that way, nor is it to be contained in a building. 
There are no shortage of stories on social media these days of people supporting their communities and finding ways in which they can uh, meet the needs of the communities. So people are indeed rediscovering the resacralization of the everyday and they have a story to tell. Where is God in those stories? This is what was so amazing about the mission of the Apostle Paul. Awkward as it probably was, he used the stories of the local or from the local context as unique opportunities to tell his story. How can we use this new reality, this new environment we find ourselves in to foster new relationships, make new friends and forge new partnerships? We heard the story of Emmaus, the road to Emmaus earlier. You know, every time I hear that story, the one line that 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 hits me more than anything else is how their hearts burn within them as they listen to Jesus unfold the good news. So think about think about those people on the other end of the phone call or the email you sent to wish them a happy birthday or the, the gift card that they received, though their hearts may have burned because of that encounter, that support, that, that good news. There's a great need for the church to find ways <clears throat> to bless everything that's happening at the local, excuse me. <clears throat> There's a great need for the church to find ways to bless everything that's happening at the local. The re-sacralization of what people are <laughs> rediscovering in the community context. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. And thanks for the cooperation and effort in, in putting together uh, this session today. Uh, Alan, we'll pass it to you for a few comments, summary comments, insights yeah. of the engagement. Yeah, yeah very briefly, uh, thanks everybody for uh, being patient with me. Uh, it, it's, it's a joy to be uh, with you. Uh, there's a lot more I'd love to say, but just some very brief comments. Uh, one, I would say, do not confuse COVID-19 as the issue. COVID-19 is a moment, it's tragic, it's difficult, it's gonna pass. But what's not gonna pass is this massive unraveling that's going on amongst us uh, in, uh, across Western societies. And that unraveling is is increasingly going to demand a different imagination for being church and clergy that's number one number two um the uh, as an anglican let me say this carefully um there's a lot going on right now that needs to be attended to and what are people experiencing and how do those experiences begin to play themselves out in ways of asking how do we be church differently in the midst of this now that is something that get that has to get worked out in a local parish particularly with the vestry and clergy and people and it's the bishop's roles to attend and to listen to that and to ask how across parishes, they begin to create experiments. So that's the second thing I would say. The third thing I will say, because this, this, this is ending and I won't get into trouble, bishops and clergy actually don't know how to do that. Um, that's my experience. And, but that's where the energy needs to go. How do we assist our vestries, our leaders in a local parish, begin to reflect upon what's happening right now and begin to address the question of experiments. That's the kind of step that's needed at this point in time, uh, which I'd be happy to talk about more at some other time. Rick, thank you. Thank you, Alan. And uh, I suspect we'll take you up on that last little offer there about how to do it, because uh, most in pastoral ministry like to have some skill sets and key actions to help them do what needs to be done yeah, the heart right. is there and the spirit is there and uh, the skill sets can be put in place so uh, we will we'll likely follow up with you on that uh, folks i'm going to pass it back to greg to uh, send us away with a, 
a prayer and a blessing. Turn on your mic and it'll, we'll hear it. Our hearts are burning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is a prayer from um, the New Zealand prayer book. A beautiful, beautiful, simple little prayer. Let us pray. God of the present moment, God who in Jesus stills the storm and soothes the frantic heart, bring hope and courage to all who wait in uncertainty. Bring a hope that you will make the equal of every whatever lies ahead. Bring them courage to endure what cannot be avoided, for your will is health and wholeness. You are God. And we need you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Greg. And thank you to all who attended uh, today. A good attendance. Thank you very much. If you have thoughts or ideas on future such uh, ventures while we're in this uh, interruption and launching into new ways of doing things, send me a note. I'd be glad to hear from you. But I want to say a special thanks to those who participated, Robin and Amanda, especially for sharing their the stories and experiences receiving some thanks there now thank you for for those messages you're sending me folks i uh, also want to say a special thanks to bishop jeff and bishop john for their engagement and participation and to uh, greg for your advice and participation in in, in this venture and uh, especially to you alan for well, you. pitching in and being part of this with us and uh, allowing this uh, the world wide web to be a great uh, a great opportunity for all of us so thank you great Thank you, folks. Blessings and uh, stay safe. God bless. God's peace. Thank you Bye. all. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.